Suppose we have a certain segment of a DNA molecule, a gene for example, that we want to amplify. And to amplify means to make many identical copies of. Now, the question is, how can we go about amplifying that gene of interest? Well, one way that we spoke about earlier is to basically take that gene, to integrate that gene into a bacterial plasmid, to place that recombinant plasmid into a bacterial cell, and then to allow that bacterial cell to divide many, many times, and eventually we form many copies of that gene of interest. Now, the problem with that method is, it's not only time consuming and not only is it ineffective, but it also limits the size of that gene that we can actually use. A much more effective and, and a much more efficient and accurate method is the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Now, the polymerase chain reaction allows us to amplify a certain gene, a certain sequence of DNA very quickly so we can produce millions or even billions of copies of a single segment of DNA that we're actually interested in. Now, let's begin by discussing what the ingredients are to this reaction. What is it that we need to actually carry out a successful polymerase chain reaction? So we have four important ingredients. Number one, we actually need that segment of DNA, the double-stranded DNA that we want to amplify, that we want to replicate. So we have to begin with a certain target DNA molecule that contains that sequence, that gene that we want to amplify. Number two, we need a pair of DNA primers. So what is a DNA primer? Well, remember, a DNA primer is a relatively short sequence of DNA, so ranges from about 20 to 30 nucleotides. And what this is used for is to initiate the process of DNA synthesis, DNA replication. <clears throat> Number three, we need heat-resistant DNA polymerase. So the reason we need a heat-resistant one is because we're going to carry out the reaction at a relatively high temperature. Now, a DNA polymerase is needed because that's the protein complex that moves along that DNA and replicates that DNA. And number four, we actually need the four different types of deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate. So remember, we have adenine, guanine, we also have cytosine and thymine. We need these four ingredients to actually produce that sequence of DNA that we want to amplify. So these are the four main ingredients. Now, the next question is, what exactly are the steps and how many steps are there within a single cycle of PCR? So basically, if we take a single PCR cycle, we can break that cycle down into three different steps. So in one PCR cycle, we have three different steps. Step number one, we call DNA strand separation. Step number two is the hybridization of the DNA primers onto that DNA that we want to replicate. And number three is the actual DNA replication, the DNA synthesis process. So this is one cycle of PCR. And we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. There are many of these cycles that actually take place to produce the many copies of that single DNA segment that we're interested in. So let's basically break down what these three steps actually involve. And let's begin with step number one, the strand separation. So suppose we have a beaker and inside that closed beaker, we basically have all these different ingredients inside a solution. So we basically have the target DNA molecule that we want to replicate. We have the pairs of DNA primers. We have the heat resistant DNA polymerase. And we also have the different types of deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate. So let's begin with step one. In step one, what we actually want to do is, is we want to increase the temperature so that we reach a temperature where the hydrogen bonds will break between those two DNA strands. So what we want to do is we want to separate the two strands of DNA. So 
Let's suppose this is the DNA molecule, our target DNA molecule. And this intersection is basically the target sequence. It's the sequence of nucleotides that we want to replicate. Now, these parts are basically known as the flanking sequence. And the reason they're called flanking sequence is because they're found right next to the target sequence. And those primers are actually going to bind to these flanking sequences, as we'll see in just a moment. So in step number one, we want to increase the temperature of that solution in which this DNA molecule is found to about 95 degrees Celsius for about 15 seconds and what this does is it breaks those electrostatic bonds those hydrogen bonds that exist between those two strands of DNA and what we have is we have a separation we have the breaking of these bonds and so the separation of these two individual strands of DNA so after step one we now have this picture as shown in this diagram so these two strands have now separated now, once we separate those two, the two strands, we begin decreasing the temperature of that solution. So we cool the solution to about 54 degrees Celsius. And the reason we cool it to that specific temperature is because at that temperature, that is when those DNA primers will begin to bind onto the flanking sequence. Now, because we're going to have so many DNA primers moving about between this region, that will keep these two single strands of DNA from forming those bonds and reforming that double-stranded helix formation. So in step number two, the solution is cooled to about 54 degrees Celsius and the DNA primers are added. So they're basically floating around. And once we cool our solution to that temperature, those DNA primers are now at an optimal temperature where they can begin binding onto the flanking sequences. Now the question is, where exactly will these DNA primers actually bind to? Well, the sequence of the DNA primers are complementary to this flanking sequence and this flanking sequence here. And so what we see is one of the primers that has a complementary sequence to this one binds onto this end and the, <coughs> and the other one binds onto the opposite end of this complementary single strand of DNA. Now, the reason this binds at the three end is because the DNA polymerase can only form the single strand of DNA, can only elongate that DNA in the five to three direction. And so that primer must form at the five end. So it actually forms at the three end of this DNA molecule so that we have a five end that begins on this side. And likewise, the other DNA primer binds onto the three end of the complementary DNA molecule so that it forms at the five end. And in the next step, when we add the DNA polymerase, the DNA polymerase can bind onto this section, this section, and can basically elongate that DNA molecule. So one DNA primer binds to the three end of one strand and the other primer binds to the three end of the complementary strand. So now we increase the temperature to about 74 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Celsius. And the reason we increase it to 72 degrees Celsius is because that is the optimal temperature of the heat resistant DNA polymerase molecule. So we have the deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates and we have that heat resistant DNA polymerase that are found in solution and which are swimming around this DNA molecule. And once we increase the temperature to 72 degrees Celsius, it's then that the DNA polymerase will bind onto the DNA and will and will begin adding those deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate molecules and will begin to synthesize, elongate that DNA. And so at the end of step number three, what we have formed is two identical copies of that DNA that we began with. So after one cycle, we amplify the number to two. 
Now, this is only one cycle of PCR. If two cycles take place, so let's suppose this is cycle number one, and now that we're in this position, we allow cycle number two to take place. Because now we have two DNA molecules, and at one, we begin with two. And so after two cycles, each one of these will be amplified to two, so we have two formed from this, two form from this, so after two cycles of PCR, we're going to have a total of four uh, individual copies of that DNA. So we see that after three cycles, we're going to have two times two times two, so eight. After four cycles, we're going to have two times two times two times two, so 16, and this process continues. And the formula, the equation that gives us the total number of copies made after n cycles is two to the n power. So, for example, if we have two cycles, two to the two is four copies. If we have three cycles, two to the eight is eight copies, and so forth. Now, about 20 to 30 of these cycles can take place within an hour. So we see that after an hour, we can form anywhere from millions to billions of copies of, of a single DNA segment. So we see that the polymerase chain reaction is very effective and very efficient in actually forming those copies and amplifying the DNA molecule that we're interested in. Uh, interested in. And one other important um, property of the polymerase chain reaction is the fact that it takes within a, within a given beaker, within a given closed container. So what that means is, after the first cycle takes place, we don't actually have to add anything into that mixture because the mixture has all the ingredients from the beginning. So after one cycle takes place, all we have to do is we have to bump up the temperature back to 95 degrees Celsius to restart cycle number two. So what that means is if cycle number one took place and we form these two double-stranded DNA molecules, all we have to do to restart the cycle is to increase the temperature to 95 and then these two DNA will begin separation and then all we have to do is change the temperature 254, so cool the solution, to go to step number two of cycle two. And then to get to step three, we have to bump the temperature back up to 72 Celsius to basically make sure that DNA synthesis takes place. So we see that PCR is a very easy reaction to actually control. All we have to do is we have a closed container and all the proper ingredients, and then we simply change the temperatures to basically ensure that the cycles continue right after the other. And so the PCR method is a much more effective method than actually using bacterial cells to replicate, to amplify the genes of interest.